Thanks, Mike. So this is going to be a, an interesting a talk, I hope. I'm going to talk a little bit about science and technology and computing futures. And I will tell a few stories. I will show some pictures from the past, some of which involved when I had hair, uh, unlike, unlike now. Um, so as I said, I want to talk a bit about how science is enabled by computing, um, some about how I think context shapes the kind of research we do in computing, a little bit about futures, and then, as I said, uh, a little bit about um, some reflections uh, about, um, uh, about what the, the past looked like. Well, let me start with uh, an observation about the kinds of questions we ask. If you think about how fast technology changes, uh, and um, I graduated from here in 83, uh, even most of the things on this list were cool and unknown at the time. Um, you know, a decade ago, most of our friends and colleagues and families uh, had never heard of phishing other than what you did with the pole. Um, spam was what you needed a can opener to eat. Um, and, but we didn't have uh, e-commerce or uh, broad access to email. Uh, and we didn't worry about digital offshoring. And I still remember the first time I pulled out a cell phone. I was in an airport and I was stranded and I drew a crowd of business people who wanted to know what I was doing. And of course, it was brick sized and the battery only lasted 15 minutes and I was probably paying a, a quarter a minute for the telephone call I was making. But I was trying to rebook my flight. And they thought, wow, that's a pretty cool concept. We could imagine what we might do with one of those things. And then six months later, I saw someone walking down the concourse at an airport firing a succession of middle managers. I know this because I heard that side of the conversation on the cell phone. Um, so the future depends on the kind of questions we ask. Uh, and so in the spirit of, if you get bored while I'm talking, let me pose a question for you to think about. And I'll come back to this at the end. And it's about risk, reward, and adventure. Um, and it's a question independent of whether you think human-based exploration is a good idea, a horrible idea, and robotic exploration is the best way to advance science. It's not that question. Questions one about your personal risk adventure reward ratio. What probability of successful return would make you the first person to sign up um, for a mission to Mars? And so think about that if I get too boring, and we'll come back to that at, at the end. But the kind of questions that you ask, and that being an example, determine the kind of answers you get. And I like to think that there are only three questions in this world worth talking about. Their life and nature and its processes. How does life work? You know, what's the, the, the biological basis of, of life? Matter in the universe and all the physical sciences and engineering are tied up with that, just as the first touches on biology and medicine. And what do they mean for the human condition? And almost all of the really interesting projects, in one way or another, touch on one aspect of one of those three questions. Uh, and answering big questions in that space, I'm convinced, <laughs> takes some boldness to engage new opportunities and to think about the unusual. And so I've launched a bunch of projects over the years, and people often ask me, what's my litmus test for deciding whether to make a bet on an individual in a project? And I have a really simple answer. It depends on how old they are and how much hair they have or, or don't have. Um, if they're younger, I ask them, what do you lie awake at night and dream about doing? And if they're older, I ask them, what do you want to tell your grandchildren you did with your life? And if they have compelling answers to those questions and some semi-rational way to try to achieve the answer to those questions, those are people worth making bets on because they're going to make a difference. They're asking interesting questions and they're willing to take some risks to make something happen. But the interesting thing to me, and the, the reason I mention these three topics, is because computing is central to all three of them. It touches on the deep nature of biological and biomedical processes. It touches on our understanding of the universe. And it touches, in both cases, on what it means for the human condition, not only in the sciences, but what it means in, in commerce and what it means in the arts uh, and the humanities. And so this threefold way notion that computing has emerged as a parallel to theory and experiment is really important. And so this notion of consilience, 
that the interactions across disciplines really matter is something that I think we don't pay enough attention to. And consilience is a word that Ed Wilson used in a, in a great book uh, about a decade ago, and he made this point that basically all of the interesting questions that every college student ought to be able to answer involve what's the relationship between science and the, humanity, and the humanities? How important is it for human welfare? Uh, and, and perhaps more tellingly, that every public, intellectual, and political leader ought to be able to answer that question as well. Uh, and so the place where technology and the arts and the humanities come together is an important space uh, because more and more of the questions that we care about lie at the intersections of all of these disciplines. Uh, and one of the things that we struggle with in our educational systems at many levels is how to break down silos. We create research centers to do that, but we struggle to break those silos down in the educational context. And that's, I think, increasingly uh, an issue. So on the science front, I want to walk through some examples and then talk a bit about technology futures and, and reflect. A couple years ago, Microsoft sponsored a, a study, and there are several analogs of this. This just happens to be the Microsoft one, asking what were the interesting questions in 2020. And the AAAS had a similar set of issues in its 125th anniversary a couple years ago. They published 125 questions uh, that were cutting-edge questions uh, that science might examine in the coming decades. If you look at that list or you look at Science 2020, the list, almost every question on that list would be impossible to answer without computing. And computing has become synonymous with science in almost every aspect. And we're at the edge, I'm convinced, of something really amazing. Uh, the, the capacity of storage, the capacity of computing, the ability to build a large-scale distributed collaboration you know, we probably won't live long enough to be able to fully elucidate the biochemical nature of life, but you can see it from where we are. You know, the ability to build complete ab initio uh, um, in silicon simulations of biological processes that have predictive capability, you can see it from here. We're not going to get there in the next few years, but you can see it. Uh, you can see some interesting questions about grand unified theories uh, and the origins of the universe. And, and those would not be answerable either without computing's continued performance and capacity increases. So I wanted to walk you through a couple examples, some of which many of you know. But think about the physical side, and then I'll say a word about the biological side. So the standard model of physics unites some, and you're probably thinking, why am I here as a computer scientist talking about physics? I want to talk about computing. If you think about the standard model of physics that's united to electromagnetism and the weak force uh, and includes the strong force, but we have this embarrassing lack of ability to explain uh, mass, um, and the grand unified theories that we've searched for haven't materialized yet, but the fact that observational data has told us that most of the matter in the universe is not the standard stuff that we know about and that the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate, uh, and that dark energy is an unexplained phenomenon. It's really interesting ferment in physics. And so the insight into those processes in physics are illuminated by computation in three ways. And I want to talk about uh, three pieces of this story. The Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which lets us peer back into deep time. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and uh, Lattice QCD is a computational model uh, that lets us test some predictions and extensions of the standard model. So if you think about the LHC, which is going to come online, assuming the magnets actually work as expected uh, later this year, um, and one of the tier two sites uh, for this data hierarchy at Purdue is here at Purdue, it's going to produce 10 to 20 petabytes of data a year. And that's after reduction uh, from a signal coming off the detectors. Being able to process and mine 20 petabytes of data a year and look for signal in that, mostly noise, has driven international expansion of high-speed networking, it's driven an international hierarchy of storage archives, and it's driven thousands of scientists to build infrastructure over the years. The notion that one could analyze this data in any reasonable way without computing is nonsensical. Computing is enabling this experiment. 
not only in the data analysis, but in the design and the potential insights. The search for the Higgs boson, you know, the, the mediation particle that uh, standard models predict to explain why there's mass. And then there's a the computational side, the ability to predict from the standard model computationally the masses of elementary particles. Lattice QCD is the virus of high performance computing. Um, and those of us who've had any interaction with it, and this is actually part of a project in which I was involved, Lattice QCD sucks, sucks up every spare cycle on every high performance machine in the world. And I spent a lot of time, as, as, as Mike said, doing science policy, and I was once forced to try to explain uh, an error bar chart on the mass of a subatomic particle to a member of Congress. And I can sell lots of things, but that, let me tell you, that one is a tough sell to explain <laughs> error bars on, on a fundamental particle. But if you look at the software infrastructure to support this, um, the architecture issues, the numerical issues that underlie the software stack, it's a computing problem. And then if you look at the LSST, which is going to do whole sky surveys, uh, in addition to looking at some near-Earth objects, those asteroids that might collide, uh, will provide some deep time survey data uh, to let us also test some extensions of the standard model. It's going to produce about 30 terabytes of data a night on a mountain in Chile. And you have to analyze that data every day, because if you don't get it done today, there will be another 30 terabytes tomorrow night. Um, again, the design of the telescope, the analysis of the data, would not be possible with the stuff, without the stuff that we all do. I mean, computing drives science. And that's one of the really interesting things. If you look at genomics and biology, come on in. Um, the easy part is sequencing. And there's no doubt that within a few years, $1,000 genome sequences will be available as routine diagnostic tests. Every one of us in a few years will have our complete genome sequence for a few hundred bucks. That's going to happen. You just look at the technology curves. That's the easy part. And that wouldn't be possible, again, without computing. But the hard part is being able to look at gene expression levels and what it means for tailored drug treatment. The ugly truth is most drugs that your physician prescribe have no effect most of the time for most people. We don't like to admit that, but it's true. In fact, we were debating in a meeting yesterday about whether we should tell the president this fact. Um, they either have no effect, or they have adverse effects, or they have too great an effect. And here's an example that any one of us who has dealt with elderly relatives or is getting older themselves knows about. If you've ever known anyone on blood thinner, blood thinner, the dose is very sensitive. If it's too low, it doesn't have an effect, and it doesn't dissolve blood clots. If it's too high, you can bleed out, and you're hospitalized, and you might die. The window's very small, but it varies widely across individuals. About half of that can be explained by genetic variation. The other half can only be explained by how those genes are expressed and environmental conditions. Being able to build models for that specificity will allow things like Coumadin and other drugs to be designed and tailored specifically for your genetic profile and for your lifestyle and for the expression of genes that you currently exhibit. Those kind of models are only possible with computing. Of course, we're a long way from the truth. And the reason why I said ab initio um, biology is a long way away is if you look at from you know, basically uh, ab initio chemistry down at the lower level to trying to model ecologies at, at the other level, this problem spans 25 orders of magnitude in time and a good 10 orders of magnitude in space. Um, this is the, the Computer Scientist Full Employment Act, um, being able to continue to build faster systems to solve problems like this. So let me come back to <clears throat> the arts and the humanities and the intersection for a moment with a, a, a quote from William Blake. Um, you know, as he said, to see the universe in a grain of sand, heaven in a wildflower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. 
we're actually not far from being able to do many of those things. And if I torture Blake for a moment and talk about that, to see the universe in the grain of sand, we're doing uh, first principles cosmological simulations that are basically trying to simulate the universe in a box. Uh, and that's happening in silicon-based computing. That's the universe in a grain of sand. Heaven in a wildflower is, is all about uh, biological modeling and our ability to reason about biological processes computationally. Infinity in the palm of your hand um, and eternity now are, well, there's still some more work to be done uh, on those things. But um, the only point of telling these stories and, and torturing Blake for a moment is how important computing is to the advancement of science. And most of my career has been living at this boundary of high performance computing and what it means to engage in multidisciplinary collaborations and the give and take that takes place across disciplinary boundaries to try to be able to create and support discovery. So with that sort of backdrop, I want to turn a little bit to technology and then, then a bit on personal reflections. So uh, as I started out um, talking about looking back, one thing about predicting the past is you know, that's not that hard to do. Um, predicting the future is much more problematic. And if you think about it, a century ago, the stuff that, that was true and the stuff that we didn't get and the stuff that we hope to get, it's always interesting to go read future predictions from 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years ago and see which things they got right and which things uh, they got wrong. You know, I was always holding out for the, you know, the, the, the jet packs um, and um, those cool, shiny plastic metal clothes that were in all those bad 1950 science fiction movies um, that we used to watch. We never got the flying cars. We didn't get the underwater cities. We didn't, uh, we didn't get any of those cool clothes. But we did get scotch tape. And um, we got uh, canned beer. Um, I once made this comment that when someone says that there are a few things better than sliced bread, um, and when someone says something's better than sliced bread, you should take that with a big grain of salt. Uh, one of my friends came up and said, well, that's probably true, but there are some exceptions that rival sliced bread and the importance to society. And I said, okay, what? And he said, canned beer. So, yeah, you know, who knows? Um, predicting the future is difficult. And, and one of the things I find interesting about that is that people in their domain of expertise are often the least proficient at predicting the future related to those technologies. Sometimes it's because we see the limitations too closely and we see the difficulties too manifest. And we get locked into a worldview that says the future will look like some incremental variation of, of the past. And that's often not true. I think the thing that we forget in computing is that most of what we do in life is linear extrapolation. Tomorrow looks pretty much like today. May, the sun may be shining rather than raining, but it'll look like today. Um, when you write exponentials, that's not true. You know, this is a long period where things don't look that much different. And then the world changes in some dramatic and qualitative way. Um, and, and that's a difficult thing about the business we're in. And that's why I say this Contra Delphi effect applies, that we're often inside the discipline not so good at predicting the future. But it does affect what we do. And so I want to tell you a story about Purdue that some of you will remember, and, and Mike Atala actually alluded to it. Think about language theory uh, and sociology and the theory that the language of speakers shapes their habitual thought. It's true in computing as well. The kind of technologies we have available shape the kind of research that we do. So think about some examples. Um, it was entirely possible to do distributed systems research in 1962. Intellectually, nothing would have prevented it. All you would have had to do would be commandeer most of the academic computing infrastructure on three or four university campuses, and you could have done it, right? I mean, it wasn't intellectually impossible, but it was practically extraordinarily difficult. And there were a few exceptions. You know, things like Andy Van Dam did at Brown when he commandeered Brown's computing infrastructure for an interactive sketch pad system, believing someday that would be cheap enough that people could carry it around. That's a leap of faith that requires you to look far enough in the future to consider some things like that. So think about what's happened in computing. When the VAX 11780 appeared, and, and Unix was available in academic departments, and Purdue got 
one of those early systems in you know, what 80, 81, somewhere around that time, uh, it dramatically changed what research looked like uh, in the department here. Workstations and Ethernet had another big impact. When I was a graduate student here, no faculty and no students had even terminals in their office. We went down the hall and shared a terminal room. Um, that shapes the kind of things you, you do because the access matters. PCs and the web had another impact. Cheap hardware uh, at large scales had that effect on not only academic research and computing, but in the sciences. And the big things that we're talking about now, about massive amounts of data, about large scale parallel computing by virtue of multicore, about cloud computing and distributed services, those are our current context. And so one of my challenges to you and to other people is don't just think about what's true now, think about what will be true in the future. And so when you think about multicore and what it means for parallelism, don't think about four way and eight way. Think about hundred way and when you have 30 different functions on chip and how you would manage that. Um, that's further into the future, it's likely to have a bigger impact. So here are some new truisms. Computing's almost free. Not quite, but close. Memory isn't. Almost everything's connected. Moving lots of data is still really hard because networks aren't that fast. You know, if you, if you do the math, um, FedEx uh, is still the fastest way to move lots of data. Um, sad but true. People are really expensive, and they're getting more so. Um, and real problems are complex. Duh. Uh, in the people are really expensive category, let me make the following observation. A teraflop of computing for a year costs less than one software developer for a year. One of those is getting cheaper. The other is not. Curves are going in opposite directions. We still have deep in our psyche, uh, in the way we approach many problems, the fact that computing is expensive. It's not. You know, if I need to solve a problem, if I need to throw 50 teraflop years at it, that's probably cheaper than hiring 10 software developers to work on the problem for a year. That wouldn't be the way we would intuitively approach a problem. So there, there are some issues there. And then the last one is we've got to raise abstraction levels if we're going to manage complexity. And I want to say a, a few more words about, about that. So here's what I think is the current landscape. We've got large-scale parallelism, and it's only going to get larger. That's what heterogeneous multicore is about. We've got really big data centers, and you have no idea how big really big means. Um, if, if you don't think about spending at least 100 megawatts to drive your data center, is not big. If you're not using, in some cases, one to five percent of the power budget of a country, you're not thinking big, because um, those are the sizes that are being built now. Um, web and hosted services, what it means for ubiquitous mobility and cheap, inexpensive sensors. And then we're pretty close to realizing something that another Bush wrote about 50 years ago. Vannevar Bush wrote at the end of the Second World War two seminal papers. One was the origins of the federal science funding complex uh, that created the National Science Foundation. And the other one was a paper written in that scholarly journal, the Atlantic Monthly, called As We May Think. And he proposed this notion of a mimics, which is basically an organized access mechanism to human knowledge that can provide information on demand. And you can see that from where we are. That's a lot of what large-scale indexing and digital information is giving us. So what does really big mean? I couldn't resist plugging in some numbers here. The kind of data centers that Microsoft and Yahoo and Google and Amazon are building are these kinds of scales. Order 100 megawatts of power, at least 100,000 servers, at least 100 petabytes of data. There are some long-term sociological and cultural issues about the human knowledge base residing in a small number of physical locations that are worth thinking about in the long term. But the whole set of issues about trying to make these more efficient, uh, everything from packaging and multicore to power cooling and environmentals and what it means to be ecologically friendly, because there aren't that many places that there's 100 megawatts of unused power. Um, so there are some substantial issues here. In fact, these set of issues is what I went to Microsoft to, to work on trying to solve. 
But what I believe is true is that we're going to build a continuum that fits the peanuts pig pen model. So if you remember uh, in peanuts, one of the minor characters, pig pen, who always had a cloud of dust that followed him around. Um, that's the notion of building a ubiquitous infosphere where we can put the right information and the right ability to act on it in every person's hands all of the time. And the combination of cheap sensors, inexpensive broadband networking, wired and wireless, back-end data analysis and, and intelligence, um, you can see that kind of thing coming. Uh, and that's what the interesting future looks like. But an, another point to think about in this space is how do we deliver experiences? We're still at some pretty crude points in a lot of this technology space in that we have distributed devices. If you've ever sworn that the information on your cell phone, whoops, um, Now well, let's go back. We're going the wrong direction here. If you've ever swore at the fact that the information on your cell phone wasn't the same on your, as on your laptop, wasn't the same on your desktop, wasn't the same on your home devices, we have discrete instances of information. Uh, and the trick is going to be making the fact that there are discrete devices go away. And we're already starting to do that in some domains. I mean, if you wanted to fool your um, non-computer savvy friends, ask them how many computers they own. Right? It's a trick question because the answer is, unless they're living in a cave, the answer is hundreds if not thousands. They're just embedded in everyday devices. And unless you're using a 30-year-old dishwasher uh, and um, uh, cooking your stuff on an open fire, you've got embedded intelligence in all the devices you use at home every day. Um, same thing is true of your car. Um, unless you're a, an antique car fanatic, you've got a lot of onboard intelligence in, uh, in, your, um, in your car. And the goal of the technology is to make experiences, not to use devices. Um, but that means blending the mobility of information across those devices in some seamless way. That has implications for this science story, and, and that's where I wanted to circle back to where I started, the question of, how do we allow distributed groups of talented people to collaborate across the barriers of time and space, share information, ask interesting questions in seamless ways? That's the challenge. And that's really about where some of this infrastructure can enable. You know, one of the things that's true about those large sky field surveys in astronomy is they challenged cultural behavior. It was once true in astronomy that uh, if you had a unique telescope, and primary access to it, you had competitive advantage in the research space because you had data that no one else had. And because you had data that no one else had, you had the leisure to explore it and ask questions that no one else could. When data is broadly available to everyone by virtue of, of large sky surveys and public databases, the culture changes from one where I have an advantage because I have something you don't to you have an advantage because you can ask better questions than I can, because we both have access to the same information. That changes the game and can be culturally very upsetting uh, because it advantages some people, and any time you advantage some, you often disadvantage others. It changes the psychology of how you approach problems. And that's one of the things that plays out in a lot of these, these technology engagements across all, all kinds of disciplines. So I spent a bunch of time fighting a bunch of these science policy issues in Washington. And I wear a suit a lot these days, um, though not at Microsoft. Um, one of the interesting things about Microsoft is um, I usually show up uh, to work wearing the kind of clothes you do. And often I'm better dressed than Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates. But uh, um, that's a conversation for another day. Um, one of the things that I've had the privilege of doing is chairing several reviews of federal science policy related to computing. And people like Gene Spafford have been involved in some of those as well. Um, the most recent one was a successor to these studies that looked at the ecosystem of funding and education and research for computing in the US. Uh, and that's this report that appeared just last year. 
Um, as part of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, we looked at the, the NIDR program, which is the networking IT R&D agenda that covers about $3 billion a year of uh, federally funded research. And we made some recommendations, uh, some of which I alluded to earlier. Uh, one was to revamp education to be more, more, more multidisciplinary and looking at engagement across different subcultures to look at these complex problems. Increase funding for those of you who are graduate students for fellowships. Um, increase visas for international students so that they could stay in the U.S. Uh, and look at longer term, higher risk, more revolutionary projects, which is both uh, a directive to the funding agencies to take more risks, uh, but to those of us in academia to embrace more risks. And if I were to give you a bad analogy, if you take your retirement money, those of you who are older, and you put it all in U.S. Treasury bills, you probably won't go broke, though you never know with the U.S. government, um, but you're not likely to get a 20% annual return on your investment. Um, you can put it, all of your retirement money into uh, venture-backed startup companies, and you might be a billionaire, but odds are you'll be broke. Um, there is a portfolio of risk and reward there, and research is the same way at the national level. We want some balanced set of incremental projects that are going to make progress for sure, and others where we have no idea what will happen, um, but we're going to try something interesting. But in terms of areas that mattered, the number one priority that emerged from a lot of surveys around the community and talking to government and academics was systems that interact with the physical world. And you can read that as distributed sensors and the environments that go with those, uh, instruments, robotics, all of the things that create interactions with the physical environment and all of the infrastructure that supports those, together with another set of, of areas um, that have continuing support for investment. So we're trying to catalyze more risk in the environment, more crazy ideas, more people who would say, yeah, this project will require the entire university's infrastructure. Can I borrow it for a few hours and give it a try um, and see what happens? But politics do matter. And so I want to tell you a story about Fermilab. And this is a picture of Robert Wilson, who was the founding director of Fermilab outside Chicago. Uh, and there's a picture there at sunset uh, of Fermilab on the right. And it's a story apropos current politics. Um, but it's a story from the Vietnam War. Wilson was called to testify uh, before Congress to the Senate Armed Services Committee about funding for Fermilab. And he was asked if the funding for Fermilab, which was a lot of money, would do anything to help defend the United States. And he told the senator, absolutely not. And somewhat incredulous at this response, the senator asked a follow-up question. So you're saying that this has absolutely nothing to do with defending the United States. Um, and he said, nope, absolutely not. What it does have to do with is this. And I love this quote. It has only to do with the respect for which we regard one another, the dignity of man, our love of culture. It has to do with, are we good painters, good sculptors, good poets? I mean, all the things that we really venerate and honor in our country and are patriotic about. It has absolutely nothing to do with the defense of our nation, but everything to do with making it worth defending. And that's part of the reason why we invest in these long-term, high-risk, multidisciplinary research projects, is because we're trying to do something that will make a difference, that makes us proud to be citizens of whatever country we happen to be about. And it's important in political times to remember that. And that's as close to a political statement as I'm going to come. But with that, I want to tell you a few stories. So that's sort of the end of technology. So this is part two, perhaps, of, of the talk. And I will come back to that opening question uh, about your risk-reward quotient in a moment. But I want to tell you a few anecdotes about opportunity, about science, about computing, about communication, about dreams and, and, uh, and community. So um, these are 
personal stories, uh, and I hope I won't embarrass myself by doing this. Um, um, so let me start with, um, with the first one. So I grew up in a small town in Arkansas, um, on the wrong side of the tracks. Uh, my father finished the fifth grade. Uh, my grandfather finished the third grade. Um, I remember what it was like to not have any food in the house uh, and to wear ragged clothes to school. But I also knew that I wasn't the poorest person in the community. There was a little girl who lived up the hill from us whose name was Kathy. And I was in the third grade when the teacher returned some of our arithmetic homework and told Kathy, who sat next to me, that she would no longer take Kathy's homework because Kathy was erasing the paper to reuse it. And because she didn't have any other paper. I knew that, but the teacher didn't know that. I knew that because I saw Kathy outside every day in the cold practicing her arithmetic on the only flat surface she had, which was the unpainted siding of her house. And I was ashamed. I was ashamed because I knew that and I hadn't done anything about it. Opportunity really matters. And what I saw happen to Kathy that day, and I remember it almost 40 years later, is Kathy's dream of a future died that day. And I knew that from the look in her eyes. Opportunity matters a lot, and it can disappear at an early age for lots of people. Um, it's not a guarantee, it's a chance. And it's important to remember that talented people come from all kinds of places. All kinds of places in the world and all kinds of circumstances. Some good, some bad, some indifferent. Um, but giving people a chance is important. And education is the only thing I know that can make that kind of difference. And so I've been lucky. The other one is to find things that you are passionate about. And I told some students at lunch, some of you are here, that there wasn't a time when I didn't know that I wanted to be a scientist. It was the most amazing thing I could ever imagine doing. So, a little anecdote from uh, uh, Peter Medawar. Um, by the way, if you haven't read his book, Advice to Young Scientists, it's, it's a great little book. It's not very thick and it's filled with humor, some of which is how to address uh, arrogance in young faculty, including being slapped with a wet fish bladder. Um, um, some advice that's a bit out of date, such as if you're giving a, a talk and you're nervous, don't point at the overhead projector because it will magnify uh, the nervousness in your hand. Um, the, uh, the current version of that is don't use the laser pointer if you're nervous because it will also magnify the nervousness in your hand. But some other useful advice uh, as well. And for me, it was realizing as a kid that science was an amazing thing. Um, you know, I built simple science experiments like I'm sure many of you did. Um, but when I was about 10, um, someone showed me a science encyclopedia. And I was amazed to learn that people actually spent their entire lives doing this amazing thing. And I thought, wow, you mean they actually pay you to do this stuff? That was a revelation. And so find something you care about. Uh, it really matters. And then the other is, is this story I was telling you about Vannevar Bush from uh, um, this Atlantic Monthly article. And this is the quote about the mimics. When I was 16, I went off to uh, the University of Arkansas on a summer program um, that NSF sponsored for um, potentially talented students uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds. It was the first time I'd ever been on a university campus. Um, and this is where I learned to program. So it was organized by physics, and I had every intention of being a physicist. And some might say that I'm still dabbling at being a failed physicist, hanging out and collaborating with them. But uh, one of the things they did was they gave us a Fortran manual and two hours of uh, how to program in Fortran. And to this day, that is the totality of my formal instruction in Fortran programming, notwithstanding the upwards of a million lines of Fortran code I've written since. But those two hours were all the training I ever got. Um, but the most amazing thing they did was they gave us carte blanche access to the university's computer center. It's an old system 360 model 50. Not very fast uh, by today's standards. My uh, cell phone's faster than that. 
but um, the ability to take um, simple mathematics and bring them to life inside the machine was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. And I saw a whole series of people troop in and out of that computer center doing that. Uh, and the notion of being able to bring alive complex phenomena that weren't amenable to closed form analytic solution uh, and bring them to life and watch what would happen from those complex intersections was an amazing thing. <clears throat> That's how I became a computer scientist. Everything else was artifact. I didn't have to be sold beyond that. The other thing that I tell students and have over the years is that communicating your story really matters. You know, my grandmother told me lots of things that were true. Um, that you have to do good work, you ought to keep your head down, and all of those things are true. Um, um, she also told me what I didn't know wouldn't hurt me. Boy, was she wrong about that. Um, but most of the things were true. Um, what she always said was, don't go out and, and tell your story, other people will. And that's not usually the case. Um, I'll tell you a Purdue story. I'm working my way forward in time here. Um, the first public presentation I gave about the work I was doing at Purdue, um, I made a mistake, which I've since learned uh, to make different mistakes, which was I attempted to explain in mind-numbing detail everything that I had done. Uh, forgetting, and I managed to confuse even my thesis advisor about what I had done um, because I explained too much. And I didn't explain why, why it mattered and why people should care. You know, the old saw uh, that a preacher should tell you what they're going to tell you, tell you, and then tell you what they told you is true. And what we in technical disciplines often forget is that marketing matters. Two ideas, one better, one inferior. The person who can market the inferior idea will usually win. And I've told my students that over and over again. Communication skills really, really matter. Even if you go off into industry, if you can't convince your colleagues that this idea will work, you won't get traction. You won't be able to make it happen. It's not just enough to have a good idea. You have to convince people that it matters. The other is, and this is probably obvious by now, about taking risks. So I will tell you a story that pains me to this day. And so this is the story from when I, after I had graduated and I'd been at Illinois for many, many years. We mounted a large-scale proposal. And Bruce, wherever you are, may remember it. Um, to do something extraordinary. Um, we were proposing to deploy the first large Linux clusters in national production. Um, I had a commitment from Bill Gates himself on the day that the Justice Department filed suit against Microsoft, um, a commitment for $40 million in cash from Microsoft for the largest open access data archive the, the US had ever deployed. Um, and an extraordinary machine, and it wasn't funded. Broke my heart. Um, we pushed the envelope, and when you push the envelope, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Um, you take the risks, um, sometimes you get the rewards, sometimes um, uh, you don't. I'd like to believe we were right, because now almost everybody builds large-scale Linux clusters, but uh, it, uh, it didn't happen then. But I am stubborn. You know, my thesis was about this bizarre notion of building high-performance machines out of lots of microprocessors. Of course, in 1978, when I started working on this, um, the 8286 um, hadn't appeared yet. Um, so that was a radical notion at the time. But um, you know, every now and then, you get lucky. So that's what I've been working on. I had one good idea, I hope, at most one. And most of us, if we're lucky in our lives, have one idea um, to look at how high performance computing interacts in domains. And that's what we did at NCSA uh, with the TerraGrid uh, and other large scale infrastructure, was to look at how large radical instruments could transform science by putting large data archives high-speed computing and distributed resources in people's hands. In North Carolina, we looked at how computing could solve societal problems. How could it help with rural health care by using inexpensive sensors and data mining to be able to predict the onset of illness uh, for people who are uninsured or underinsured? 
how could we predict flooding in low-lying areas and change insurance policies so that they were more equitable. And at Microsoft, I'm looking at some of those large-scale issues about how we put uh, ideas and commerce and science uh, into people's hands uh, by virtue of large-scale infrastructure. So the last thing I want to do is say a few words about Purdue and go back to when I had hair uh, and when computer science uh, was in the math science building. And uh, John and Walter and others of us uh, uh, and Tim remember that. So a few personal stories. And I walked around last night to remind myself of the location of these. I came to Purdue in January of 1979 on a day when the high temperature that day was three. And it didn't get above single digits for all of January. Um, and I figured as someone who'd grown up in Arkansas that this was normal. Um, and only to later learn that that was the most brutal winter that had happened here in probably 20 years. But no one told me that until much later. Um, I was a TA my first semester here. Um, and since I showed up in the middle of the academic year, um, I was pretty sure I was low man on the totem pole. Uh, and so whatever section I was going to be a TA for, I was sure it would be the least desirable slot, and I was right. Uh, I got the 7.30 a.m. section, and I got to watch the sun rise um, out the windows uh, in University Hall uh, for an entire semester. Uh, it was an interesting subset of my section that showed up each day. There were a core group of about 10 people who would come every class period, a rotating subset that would make it one or two days a week, depending on whether they woke up in time uh, to make it to 7.30. Lots of late nights in math science working on projects, fighting for access to those shared terminals. Um, something that I, uh, students lots of places take advantage of, inexpensive tickets to performing arts, um, and a real cultural treat by, by virtue of that. Midnight movies, um, the double E building, I don't know if they still do, but they used to show $1 movies at midnight. But I do have one memorable experience. I went to see The Deer Hunter at midnight. And those of you who have seen it, it involves a Russian roulette scene. It's an incredibly depressing movie. So I walked out about 2 AM uh, after I even seen this movie and thought, I'm going to die here if I don't finish my thesis, and went back to my office and worked all night. <clears throat> Um, lots of uh, friends in intramural athletics playing for the infinite hoops. Um, a tradition that's apparently died uh, when um, PhD students um, who passed qualifying exams uh, threw a party uh, for the graduate students and faculty. Um, I'll show some pictures of that, some I hope not too embarrassing in a second. The VAX I mentioned, and the long history of interest in, in machines uh, that goes back um, uh, to Saul Rosen days uh, with uh, the CDC 6600 uh, and other great machines. What I didn't know at the time was Gordon Bell, who was one of the chief designers of the VAX, and now a good friend of mine. And I knew lots and lots of people who were involved in the 6600, the cyber series, and the craze that followed thereafter. It really is a small world. Uh, and a lot of friends uh, and colleagues for a lifetime. Lots of the faculty uh, and students remain friends and rem remain research collaborators. This is one of my prized possessions in the lower right there. That's Dennis Gannon, who was on the faculty here and still a, a faculty member at IU. He and I uh, have collaborations to this day. But that picture on the lower right is a picture of me, my advisor, Herb Swetman, his advisor, Jim Brown, and Jim's advisor. Uh, and a transition from PhD chemist and chemistry faculty member to PhD chemist and computer science faculty member to computer scientists um, across four generations. Um, he does. And so these are some pictures from an, um, an old quo fat. You'll recognize some of these people. That's uh, Doug Comer up there playing foosball um, with um, um, <clears throat> Some other folks. Um, this is, is Steve Talopka. You may recognize some of you there on the right, uh, and Saul Rosen, Sean Arthur, uh, and Peter Denning. The person incognito in the bunny suit um, was a former faculty member named um, um, Mike O'Donnell. Um, I have some other pictures of faculty inebriated, but I'm not going to show those. So, uh, what is interesting about these parties is, is it was the socialization that took place and, and not just the information exchange. And for graduate students struggling along, it reminded you that the faculty were human too, uh, uh, just, just like you.
Uh, and so I still stay in touch with lots of these guys. We get together on a regular, regular basis. All right, I want to tell you one last story, uh, and then, then I will be done. Some of you may remember the story of Ernest Shackleton, and I want to come back to the risk-reward issue. Um, Shackleton was an, an Antarctic explorer um, before the First World War, uh, an unfortunate one. If you remember, um, his ship, the Endurance, was crushed in the Antarctic ice, and he took his men overland, uh, left them, and took one boat and sailed uh, on the open water uh, in, um, to a Norwegian fishing um, outpost uh, off the coast of South America and, and rescued them all. Uh, they escaped without loss of life. Ironically, many of them then died in the First World War, but um, different story. One of the um, um, interesting anecdotes about Shackleton is, is this picture over on, on the, uh, the left. It's a story that's not true, but the story is more interesting than the truth. So the story is this, that this advertisement appeared in the London newspapers about 1905, inviting people to participate in this expedition. And the story, the urban legend says that 5,000 people responded. Now many people have gone to look for the original advertisement. It's never been found. So the story is almost certainly not true. But what's interesting is the psychology of the story. And what the notice says, for those of you who can't read it, it says, men wanted for a hazardous journey, it was the early 1900s, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. And so, as I said, the, 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 the legend is that 5,000 people responded. And of course, the story is not true, but the fact that the, the story persists is interesting. So, which takes me back to this. You know, what's your risk reward ratio? Because basically, all of those things apply to an adventure like this. Um, and so, I've heard all kinds of answers. You don't have to tell me what your personal answer is. There are some people who say 100%, uh, which is unachievable by any imagination. Driving home today for all of you with 100% safety is not achievable. You know, that's not possible. There are other people for whom zero is a perfectly acceptable answer. Aren't there many ways to achieve immortality in this world? And this one potential way to do it. Um, there are lots of other people for whom some non-zero probability, but you know, zero to 20% is worth a shot. Um, all of us have different points along the spectrum. Uh, but in a last produced story, think about the business about policy and will and risk and ask yourself this other question in the, in the spirit of Neil Armstrong. What year of birth did you have a higher probability of walking on the moon? 1930 or 1970? And the answer, of course, is 1930. Whether we should or not, different question. But it speaks to risk reward and political mindsets and policy. And that's what I wanted you to think about. So thanks to Purdue and for all that it has done for me over the years. Thanks for the knowledge base. Thanks for making me a scientist. Um, thanks for giving me dreams about the future. And thanks for a lifetime of friends. It's a real privilege to be here. Thank you very much. The 6600 or the oh, 205? Any CDC machine or any or software, whatever. <laughs> so one of the things that um, Tracy Kidder said in his book, The Soul of a New Machine, you know, which appeared actually while I was here, and Tracy Kidder came and spoke on campus. Um, and there's a great, I, you know, it's interesting because I now know many of the people in that book. But one of the things one of the people said in that book about the computing business, um, and this is before the death of Data General, was computing, and this is a data, dated anecdote too, but computing's like playing pinball. Your reward for winning is you get to play again. If you build a successful machine, you get to build another one. When you don't build a successful machine, you don't get to build another one. Um, and CDC made some bad choices. Um, as, 
did some of the other companies. Um, you know, Andy Grove's comment about only the paranoid survive in the computing business is absolutely true because of the nature of exponential change. If you keep doing what you're doing, you will go out of business because tomorrow will not look like today. And that's what's been the death of many, many computer companies over the years, is the fact that the whole ecosystem of the possible changes. I used to kid my students who would ask for old exams. Sure, I'll give you the old exams. The questions don't change, but the answers do. Uh, and it wasn't just because I was making them up at random. It's because from a technical perspective, some of them literally did change. Um, and so you have to be willing to take risks. You have to take informed risk. But a lot of those companies died because they made some bad choices or the technology went in an unexpected direction uh, where you know, if you were the last company to build a machine with core memory as opposed to the first company to build a machine with semiconductor memory, you know, you made a bad choice. Um, if you made the wrong one, you know, a few months the other direction, you could have been a winner. Um, so it's a, it's a risk reward thing. Um, but I think the great challenge for us right now is to rebalance the risk portfolio, not to take all crazy risks, but to take a reasonable number of larger risks uh, and say, what are some interesting ideas um, and what's the right scale of resources to attack them rather than saying, this is the scale of resource I can get. What questions could I answer in this, within this bound? Um, because you can change the game if you ask interesting enough questions. And my point about the Mars question and some of the other stories was the way you change the game is by engaging people in a dream about what could be. Because people will do amazing things if they believe in something that's bigger than what they think they can achieve by themselves. And they will change the space of the possible. Um, otherwise, you just keep doing the same thing again. And that's, that's the fun part uh, about all of this uh, exponential change. Mike. I have a quick question. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the hazards of using computers to uh, predict or simulate reality in view of perhaps some unrecognized chaotic properties of the system, or perhaps model of reality or of people's behavior or the economy that like suddenly ceases to function? Uh, what are your thoughts on the hazards of doing that? Well, I mean, all models are abstractions of reality, right? And that's why modeling is an art form rather than a science. Is, you know, the, the only f um, truly um, high fidelity simulation of reality is reality. Um, and so when you simplify, you know, you're, you're making some assumptions that some details can be ignored. Um, and you, know, you take some risk with that. Uh, I mean, that's why you always want experts involved in the process. Because once you put models in the hands of non-experts, they don't know where the minefield is about the limitations of the assumptions. Um, and that's where that continual feedback occurs. So yeah, there are, there are absolutely risks. And to the chaotic nature, yeah, there's some things that, you know, from a deep mathematical perspective, you, you can't predict. You know, all you can at best do is you know, statistically characterize the phase space about what the most likely kind of scenarios are and then you know, make some assumptions based on that. The web was the biggest one. So I'll tell you an Illinois story. Um, you know, and those of you who've been in Illinois will remember this. When Mosaic first appeared, Mosaic was not the first collaborative tool that NCSA built. There was a previous tool called Collage, which was, is, you know, in the same family as those two names might suggest, were about trying to support collaboration. And, you know, Mosaic wasn't a completely blessed project either, um, given that it had student involvement, not all student involvement, but some. When I first saw Mosaic, I had two reactions. One, wow, this is really cool. Um, the other one was, um, there's nothing I can do with Mosaic that I can't do with anonymous FTP. And that literally was true, right? You know, I could go to the sites and download the pictures and the text. Um, wasn't as easy, but you could do it. And you know, it, it didn't give you any new power. One of my friends pointed out that there was a whole subpopulation that couldn't spell anonymous for whom this actually was a big improvement. Um, and I dare say there's more than one computer scientist who learned to spell anonymous because using FTP was, that was required. Um, but Mosaic, um, 
Microsoft completely missed um, the web space, um, and it, it suffered a long time for that. It's dealing now with sort of some of the web 2.0 artifacts because it didn't miss search, but what it missed about search was Google's insight on how to monetize search, that you could sell advertisement, because there were lots of great search engines before Google appeared. You know, those of you use Alta Vista or other search engines before that. But monetizing search was something that Microsoft didn't think of, and that changed that whole landscape too. So, um, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. There's a new release of uh, Windows Compute Cluster that will appear soon. Um, there are many things going on, including the engineering ones related to optimizing performance so that on equivalent hardware you can deliver a larger fraction of the hardware performance. Um, but one of the other issues relates to the usage model and community. So most, and this, is, this is a comment on culture. There are two communities about computing. There are people like us who care about computing as an end. Most people care about computing as a means. So if you're thinking about where um, a Windows-based computing infrastructure has ready access, it is as a seamless desktop extension. So that your desktop tools simply run faster because they're running on a back end, on a compute cluster or the cloud but you have the same familiar desktop metaphor and interfaces that you, um, you always are accustomed to using. There are examples of that, some, some, some interesting, some more prosaic. There are people with Excel spreadsheets bigger than you could imagine, you know, with millions of rows in them. Uh, and when you do a pivot on a million row Excel spreadsheet, it's not fast. Um, there are extensions that allow those kind of things to run on a back end. Um, you know, similar kind of things exist with other desktop tools. If you think about MATLAB uh, and the penetration that MATLAB has in the engineering community, those kind of computations that can, via a Windows-based interface, can be accelerated on the back end, financial markets, engineering markets, those are places where there's, there's obvious penetration. The other goes to um, what do you want to pay for? You want to pay for the software up front, or do you want to pay for the back end operating cost? You know, one of the things that's a cultural issue, and I saw this, and this is not a Linux Windows comment, but more general about burning down generations of students in different cultures. Those of us in academia live in a world where, by and large, labor is cheap, but capital is expensive. You know, it costs a lot to go buy a thing, but it's not hard to go send some more people off to work on something because how we pay for them isn't always obvious. They get paid for out of lots of pots of money. Um, industry's the other way around. People are really, really expensive. But if I can spend $100,000 and have a solution tomorrow, hey, go spend the money, because I got a solution tomorrow. And those people, they cost a quarter million dollars a year. Um, so there's a different kind of dynamic that applies in, in the different spaces. But trying to recognize the total cost of ownership in the different environments, it's, it's very different. But what I, where I was going was, We've all seen cases where graduate students or postdocs spent a large fraction of their time running infrastructure as opposed to doing the science. And that's not what you came to school to do. Um, you came to school to do the science, not to be a system administrator. So anything that can drive that out of the system uh, and let more people focus on the real thing they're trying to do is the goal. And that's where some of the cloud infrastructure hosted support comes into play, whoever happens to host it or wherever it happens to be hosted. So Microsoft is a large company. There's almost nothing that Microsoft isn't looking at. Um, and it's sort of like asking, you know, what is Purdue looking at? Um, the answer is large and varied, and no one of us in this room knows all of the answer. But yes, there are people absolutely looking at virtual worlds uh, and what um, some of the implications of those for, for collaboration, for research and engagement. I will tell you a story about Second Life. Um, one is, uh, 
I have given a, a lecture in Second Life. Um, that was an interesting experience, being uh, introduced by a dog, Mike, as opposed to a person, <laughs> um, you know, because that was the avatar. Um, you know, so um, it, it's also a bit unnerving to have people fly out of the room in the middle of your talk. Um, so, but there, w there is a social community there. The story I was going to, the other story was a story that Irving Vlodsky Berger told me, who used to be a senior VP at IBM. And IBM is looking at, has been looking aggressively at, um, at, at virtual world technologies to support its distributed workforce. Because when IBM closed lots of branch offices, a large fraction of its employees actually work at home. Uh, and they communicate, I know this because my wife's an IBM executive, I watch her work at home. Um, they communicate by instant messaging, email, and telecon. Unless you travel, you can work for a month and not see a single person other than your family uh, and what you do in your normal life. You won't see any of your colleagues, even though you, you interact with them in some ways every day. What IBM found when they used done some experiments with Second Life was that the sense of presence you get with an avatar um, who actually looks at you uh, changes the sense of community that you get and creates more sense of engagement uh, among employees. It's a, it's a social kind of experience. Because if you've ever logged into Second Life and, and have tried to figure out how to, how to uh, manage your avatar, if you don't interact with it very often, it falls asleep. And that can be unnerving too when your audience falls asleep on you. I had that happen to me also. Um, the other, other affectation about Second Life, one of my staff built an avatar for me because I had some other things going on. And they did two things for me. One, they sent me to the virtual gym. So I had some pretty good pecs you know, for working out in the virtual gym. The other was I said, I want a little more hair. I don't want all my hair back, but I want a little of it back. So I got some more hair uh, and I got some upper body strength in, in Second Life. Those, those were the two things I got from the experience. Thank you very much.